What is up, internet? We have an awesome book review. This is one of my favorite books that I've discovered in the past four, four to five years. This book is so epic. Uh, the Musical Truth, Volume 1 by Mark Devlin. Mark Devlin begins with an important caveat, caveat, caveat in the foreword, reminding us that not everything in this volume is absolute truth. It is imperative to do your own research. Do not throw the baby out with the bathwater on the account that something doesn't sound right. We are also informed to get the most out of the book. In order to get, in, oh gosh, in order to get the most out of the book, we must read it in order. If for some reason we can't, he says we should at least read through the the like the last three chapters, the chapter on predictive programming on top of the last two chapters because this is where the imperative information resides. So chapter one, The Road to Truth. Devlin gives us some background about his DJing career and how he came up, discussing how the music industry started becoming more and more degenerated over time. Uh, this is a direct quote. Lyrics in hip-hop, once a wonderfully creative, energetic, and inspiring genre, and had all gone the same way, had all gone the same way, and talk of sex, champagne, gold chains, assorted high fashion brand names, and girls with big butts in the club were the only subjects that ever got referenced, page four. Uh, chapter one ponders on the nature of our civilization, <laughs> civilization today, about how our world came to be and the types of beings that are in control of our world. Um, bringing up Big brain words like cognitive dissonance, the illusory concept of money, and even conspiracy theory, a phrase specifically created by the CIA in the 1960s to discredit those who were asking valid questions about the JFK assassination, page 8. Oh, whoops, that was another, that was another direct quote. Um, this chapter does a great job on preparing us for the coming knowledge, asking thought-provoking questions, uh, a little too saucy for YouTube. And speaking of sauce, uh, we still have Jalapeno Joe's hot sauce in the cupboard. Best hot sauce I've ever had in my entire life. I'm going to leave descriptions of Jalapeno Joe's hot sauce in the, in the description of this video because I just can't, I literally can't stop talking about it. His hot sauce is phenomenal. And he, I know he, he puts a lot of care into that hot sauce, but uh, I got to keep going on. There are also a lot of juicy quotes like this one by Albert Einstein on page, on page 11. Uh, Condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. Uh, bringing us to chapter two. Nothing new under the sun. The dark manipulations of the music business are as cold as the industry itself, and early examples of the dubious calling cards evident in the contemporary scene are equally present in its formative years. Mind control, military, intelligence, uh, a P word that's literally too saucy for for uh, YouTube. So instead of saying that P word, we're going to say Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, and I'm sure you intelligent people on the internet can figure out what I mean by that. Uh, okay, so uh, military intelligence, I'm not going to say that word for because living in fear that YouTube might shut our channel down, right? So uh, military intelligence, <laughs> Jeffrey Epstein and occult fashion are, it seems, nothing new, page 17. And he uses a different word, obviously. He didn't use the word Jeffrey Epstein. Um, here we start driving in the conspiracy theory realm, a word I personally can't stand beginning with the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. For starters, Elvis fell in love with a 14-year-old girl while serving in the army as an order-following coward. Uh, <laughs> Uh, rumors that he faked his death began to spread after fans started claiming Elvis sightings. Uh, it is an intriguing fact that a novel titled, uh, the novel titled Orion by Gail Brewer Giorgio, I hope I pronounced that correctly, was ordered to be withdrawn from bookshelves by the publisher despite being paid in advance. There is even a case of two Pennsylvania businessmen buying up all the copies of uh, all the copies of this book from a local bookstore. Um, these facts become more credible when you realize Elvis was employed as an undercover agent for military, police departments, and others in several cities of our very own DEA. <laughs> 
Uh, don't forget the word conspiracy theory. Never had a negative connotation attached until the JFK death. And I actually didn't know this until I physically read the book. Right? Like, I listened to the audio book of this. I listened to the audio book, uh, you know, quite a few times because I got the audio book for free through Amazon. So I listened to the audiobook quite a few times, and when I actually physically read the book, I retained a lot more information, and I learned a lot more than what I would have learned from just using the audiobook. Hey! Stop it! It's chaos around here. Nobody's helping me. No. <laughs> uh, don't forget the word conspiracy theory, which leads us into the lives of Buddy Holly, my one of my heroes. All right, may he R.I.P. Uh, Oh, I'm not wearing the glasses. I used to wear, like, yellow glasses, and people always say I look like Buddy Holly. I used to have a pair of uh, all-white ones. I miss those glasses, man. Those are my favorite. Uh, but anyways, which leads us into the lives of Buddy Holly, the Big Bopper, Richie Valens, Eddie Cochran, and the rest. Uh, the book briefly mentions Buddy Holly's flight of February 3rd, 1959. We're not going to explore those rabbit holes, but there is a website mentioned, and the website is awesome. It goes so extensive into into the lives of these of these rock stars um uh the website is angelfire.com slash music five i'll i'll put it in the link in the description don't worry uh it has an extensive amount of articles on various musicians that worked with buddy holly and how they died including his wife and his child i think off the top of my head i'm not sure about that one don't quote me on that uh one of the articles reads while holly was touring england in 1958 he received an ominous message from a british producer joe meek meek attended a tarot reading and acquired the message february 3rd holly dies and if you know anything about tarot uh that's that's pretty intriguing bit of information there um holly being a gentleman thanked him uh, buddy holly's such a gentleman man he thanked him for the information but didn't give it a second thought since the date had already passed, uh, and then Buddy Holly then died in the infamous plane accident on February 3rd, 1959, the following year. Whew. That's intense. Uh, <laughs> but this is the type of information that this book has. It'll This book will lead you down, uh, you know, if you're like me, I'm a musician, I love Buddy Holly. When I read that, I went down the entire rabbit hole of the website, and I spent like hours on this web, on this Angel Fire website looking into this, because it was just fascinating, fascinating information. Um, from there, Mark Devlin takes us through the British music industry in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, we learn of some of the disgusting perverts that work for the... <laughs> <laughs> I forget, I forget some of the notes that I write. Uh, some of the disgusting perverts that work for the BBC, as well as the sirs and the lords that kneel before the queen, like Sir Elton John, who has an appreciation of Aleister Crowley and ritual magic. Um, his song, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, is said to be written in which language? Um, Mark teaches also teaches us about Elton's perverted escapades, like... Uh, Elton John got into some Jeffrey Epstein territory, such as performing a charity concert with backup dancers dressed as Boy Scouts. <laughs> or being searched at an airport busted with a uh, not-safe-for-work photo of a, of a minor uh, and labeling it as art. <laughs> Disgusting. Disgusting. And um, because of Elton John's status as an artist, he basically got away with it. Nobody batting an eye about him having a, a, a photo of a nude underage. Um, <coughs> Jeffrey Epstein territory, like I said, Jeffrey Epstein territory. Um, Pete Townshend of The Who dabbled in the purchasing of uh, dis uh, Jeffrey Epstein prawn. I have to say prawn because, you know, the um, <laughs> the platform I decide to use, they might, you know, like I said, they kick me off. Mark Devlin himself is actually banned from YouTube. He has interviews, there are various interviews that he is in on YouTube from other creators, but uh, YouTube basically destroyed all of his work. Hopefully he had a backup. But, uh, yeah, YouTube destroyed a lot of Mark Devlin's work, which is even, like, the fact that I'm doing this book review is kind of, like, ah, I might get banned, but oh well, I'll go to a different website, I don't care. It'll just take a lot of work. Uh, Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin, uh, <laughs> that's really not funny, but the way I wrote it 
is kind of funny. Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin laid pipe frequently with minors, as well as David Bowie. Both are big fans of Aleister Crowley. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, am I right? Oh, I almost forgot. Bill Wyman of the Rolling Stones as well. He, I think he laid pipe with, uh, with miners. Miners who work at, you know, coal miners, right? <laughs> um, since I mentioned Crowley, for those who don't know, he's the founder of Thelema, a prolific writer, and as well as a drug addict. Uh, uh, Anton LaVey was highly influenced by Crowley. Uh, LaVey is the founder of the Church of Satan, for the, like I said, for those who do not know. Um, Chapter 3 covers a lot of the sick, disgusting perverts that work for the BBC, including Jimmy Savile and his known associates. Since I don't know much about those people in the chapter, uh, you know, I, I don't know much about you know, everything that goes on across the pond. I know more about what goes here on in America. So, here's a quote from the book. There's no doubt that this section only scratches the surface of the sick, filthy, sordid nature of what really goes on beneath the surface. Uh, glit, surface glitz of the entertainment industry and the alternative stories will be legion. People often express bewilderment at how one industry can spawn such depraved be behavior, immoral lifestyles, and negative outcomes. In fact, it's not much different from another level of the establishment, that of politics. <laughs> uh, this is an area infested. Wow, I love that I use that word. Uh, in fact, wait, no, I'm, this is a direct quote from the book. Wow, I'm not taking credit for your work, Mark Devlin. He uses this. This is an area infested, infested with the same type of activity. When you really get down to it, much as the mainstream media may try to downplay it, and politicians are selected for prominent positions in such is much the same way that Hollywood actors, TV personalities, and music artists are. That's a direct quote from page 53. Um, so chapter 4. Living is easy with eyes closed. Man, I heard that. Shoo! Ignorance is bliss. Ain't that, ain't that a fact. Woo-wee! Um, in this chapter, Devlin begins discussing the Beatles and the many rumors that surrounds their success stories. One of the prominent rumors being that the Beatles are a product of the Tavistock Institute, uh, one of those think tank corporations. Shout out to Think Tank. Uh, they played. They they used to be a punk rock band, but now they broke up. Think Tank. I miss I miss you guys. If you guys happen to see this video, um, Dr. John Coleman theorizes that the Mop Tops didn't even write their own songs, and they were used as a tool to normalize drug youth amongst the youth. <laughs> Right, the first, the first um, inquiries, uh, uh, the first implementation of the degeneracy in, in the music in the music scene. Um, we are we are taught of yet another author, Joseph Nizgoda, that writes of a demonic curse that supposedly followed John Lennon. Um, Lennon entered a contract with the devil in the early days of the group, which promised twenty years of fame in exchange for his soul. If that's true, I think it's healthy to say Yoko was a demon that came to make sure old John followed through. <laughs> and if you watch, if you watch the Yoko own a video with Chuck Berry and John Lennon, that statement probably isn't too far from the truth. Um, if the deal was struck in the 1960s, it meant Lennon would die in 1980. John Lennon died December 8th, 1980, by getting shot outside of his residence in New York City. Um, I wish I had like a, a crowd going like, oh, sound bit, but <laughs> we all, I only have like five buttons on this freaking cheap thing. Because we have so much money over here at Being Live Visions. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, shout out side resident. Another writer is in an uncredited article talks about the newspapers would write that police had to hold back thousands of screaming fans. In reality, newspapers would crop three screaming girls in the photos. There were usually less than eight fans present at these at these uh, you know when they were getting off the plan. Usually less than eight fans present. The publicity stunt ensured that there were screaming fans when the Beatles made their Ed Sullivan's appearances. And uh, you can watch those Ed Sullivan's appearances on YouTube. Uh, look up the Beatles' Ed Sullivan. They're all over the place. Um, in the BBC, uh, here's a direct quote. 
In the BBC documentary John Lennon 24 Hours, Lennon is with Yoko, Yoko Ono going through letters sent by fans. He reads out one from someone saying that they've been using a Ouija board and received a message that someone will try to assassinate him, writing, The spirit that gave me the information was Brian Epstein. Uh, almost exactly 11 years later, the prophecy came true. Page 64. And again, uh, like what? Just like the Buddy Holly thing, that's... that's mind-blowing stuff there. The chapter closes out on the discussion of the symbols when it comes to the album's covers and uh, uh, where the band where the band names where the band name comes from. Very intriguing information. Uh, chapter 5. Paul is dead, isn't he? <laughs> uh, the, the chapter this chapter goes into excruciating detail about how the Paul is the, about the Paul is dead theory. For those who have not heard, PID is a theory that claims Paul McCartney died and was replaced by Billy Shears. Uh, as Mark Devlin says in the book, this theory will send any curious chap into a week-long escapade of occulted research. Uh, it is quite the deep rabbit hole. Um, yeah, and like I said earlier, yeah, that's a, that's a, the Paul is dead theory sent me down a hole huge rabbit hole. Uh, funny story, the first presentation I ever did was a PowerPoint on this very same subject. Um, my teacher made me cut down a majority of the slides because I uncovered enough evidence to fill the entire one hour block of class because the class is like 45 minutes and then you had 15 minutes to get to your next class, middle school, right? They were preparing for your, for, for, preparing for the job, get you in the job world. And then she gave me a C plus. I'm still mad about that. She gave me a C plus. I wonder if I struck a nerve. She did say she was an ad, avid fan of the Beatles. <laughs> So, I highly recommend doing your own research and coming up with the occlusion yourself on the topic. The evidence speaks for itself, if you can find it. Uh, chapter 6, Rolling in the Deep. This chapter starts diving into the career of the Rolling Stones and their disgusting debauchery, starting off describing how their live, how their live shows had an energy of tension and attracted drunk... Uh, I, in the notes, I, it says, attracted drunk degenerates. I would add, drunk hillbilly degenerates. <laughs> One example describes a free concert where a black 18-year-old named Meredith Hunter was beaten and stabbed to death in front of the stage while they performed in December 1969. Um, uh, the, the antagonist was, was a member of Hell's Angels, the so-called angels were rumored to be hired for security. One of the camera operators of that night just so happened to be George Lucas of all people. <laughs> Wild, right? What a coincidence. Uh, the chapter doesn't end there, taking us through the life and mysterious death of Brian Jones, founding member of the Stones. We also learn of a chap named Kenneth Anger, and to close the chapter we get to another mysterious death. 2014, Mick Jagger's 49-year-old, uh, I think that was his wife? 40, uh, Mick Jagger's 49-year-old wife, Loren Scott. I can't keep up with the Stones. It's no wonder why they have the sim have sympathy for the devil. Uh, personally, I've never been a big fan of the Stones, especially after reading this book, so I'm going to gloss over this chapter, uh, but my own opinion should not keep you from studying this and doing the research, especially if you take any value from music. Uh, Chapter 7, Adventures in Psychedelia, Milita Military Intelligence Connections in the LSD Era. No matter how paranoid or conspiracy-minded you are, what the government is actually doing is far worse than you can imagine. William Bloom, formerly of the U.S. Uh, formerly of the U.S. State Department. Um, we dive deeper in... We dive deep in this chapter, and then it only gets deeper. Uh, the author makes a connection with LSD in the, in the 60s, the era known for making it cool to tune in and drop out with the help of MK Ultra. Uh, and then I found out in this book that the, M the K in MK Ultra stands for control, and it's, it's kind of like a sort of Easter egg to its Germanic, to its Germanic roots which I thought that was very uh, interesting. This ultimately created a generation gap. With these connections to, with these connections, we see our trusty government's goal to break up the traditional, traditional family values and normalize drug use. Um, LSD was all over California and readily available. Mark mentions a music festival called the Monterey International Pop Festival. 90,000 people gathered to be self-indulgent <laughs> and getting high with Lucy. Uh, police were in attendance, no arrest made. Uh, 
If you follow the channel, you know about how the punk rock band Crass organized multiple free music festivals and the police brought violence to every single one, every single one of those music festivals. Why is this pop festival in the land of Holy Wood any different? Bringing to mind the extremely lucrative festival that goes on to this day, the Gathering of the Juggalos. You can find video evidence of people inhaling laughing gas, inhaling whippets, fighting, dropping acid, among other things, all while there's a strong police presence. To get a ticket to this shit show, you need $200, and that doesn't include parking. And the reason why I mentioned Crass, I didn't write it in the notes, but I mentioned Crass because our, one of our previous book reviews we've done on a book called The Last of the Hippies. That book is phenomenal, and if, if you're into this book, that's, that's a, a great rabbit hole to go down. And again, you could buy that book, Last of the Hippies, for like six, seven, eight dollars. You can get it on Amazon. Um, I don't know if Penny Rambaud, the writer of that book, sells them her, herself like Mark Devlin does. But like, same thing for this book. You can go to Mark Devlin's website and, and buy this book directly from Mark, which is absolutely awesome. I wish we would have done that. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and then from there, Mark Devlin also reminds us that Wood, the Woodstock funding, the funding of Woodstock came from John Roberts, the man credited as being the guy who synthesized LSD. Um, so chapter eight, signs of the times. Uh, and this chapter, uh, Devlin reminisces uh, shout out to Valedictorian. He's got an awesome song called Reminiscing. I'm gonna put that. I'll put a. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the description. Uh, <laughs> Devlin reminisces his youth like this. Like oh wow. Uh, by comparing. By comparing music videos he saw as a lad growing up. Referencing VigilantCitizen.com, we start to learn of the dark intentions, the hidden hidden in the music today, uh, beginning with Rihanna's song Umbrella, which was a song originally written for Britney Spears. Here's a quote by and here's a quote from the Vigilant Citizen. In a nutshell, the song talks about a storm that's about to take place and Rihanna offers her loved one a protection under her umbrella. In the song, you can stand under my umbrella can have a sexual connotation but mostly means you can be under my protection. This something has more power than you reading your own security, or regarding your own security, you depend on it, it has control over you. Here is a list of bizarre music videos in the same vein as Umbrella. <clears throat> okay, Azalea Banks, Young Rapunzel, Jesse J, Price Tag, Kanye West, Power, and the video Black Skinhead, Lil Wayne's Love Me, Robin Think, Robin Thicke, Get Her Back, Madonna Like a Prayer, Kesha Die Young, Duran Duran's Union of the Snake, Michael Jackson's Thriller, and the music video of Beat It. That was a very intriguing one. Uh, before this chapter concludes, we are taught where the phrase Illuminati comes from, and we discuss some of the reasons the dark occultist and the dark Illuminati would put these consistent symbols in pop music and beyond. One-eye symbolism, pyramids, and other symbols are littered throughout the TV show Entourage and through countless amounts of other things in that medium of entertainment. Uh, chapter 9. Oh, chapter 9, 10, 11, and 12 have to be briefly summarized. Uh, the amount of information is so extensive, it is almost overwhelming. Mark Devlin being the pro prolific researcher that he is, gives so many avenues of evidence for the reader to indulge in. Uh, beginning with hand gestures that pop artists are notorious for using um, the devil horns or Jay-Z's uh, diamond, I think if that's it, I don't... I don't know, but I don't care about Jay-Z. <laughs> um, there, are, there are also countless amounts of the numbers 666 that appear as well. Uh, like in um, Beats by Dre, uh, the logo is literally a six. But um, do with that information what you will. We learn of the bloodline tie to the Rockefellers. The bloodline tie the Rockefellers have with the music industry and the lives of artists like Jay-Z, Beyonce, Led Zeppelin, Madonna, Nicki Minaj, and Katy Perry. Uh, notice a lot of brainwashed celebrities who turn out to be degenerates all come from the famous Mickey Mouse Club. Uh, chapter 10 goes into great detail about backmasking the idea of playing a song backwards to see what, what message might reveal itself. Chapter 11 hits on the topic of MKUltra, Operation Paperclip, and how that is related to Hollywood. Uh, 
deep stuff. Deep stuff. I'm kind of like I'm going really fast because we I don't know how long the camera's gonna stay alive, and we 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 need an upgrade on our memory cards too. But um, telling telling of Britney Spears and other scandals and debauchery, Monarch programming, the ninety the ninety seven film conspiracy theory, and of course the and of course the CIA also make an appearance, leading us to a fan a fascinating topic. I find myself talking about constantly, which is. Predictive programming. <laughs> um, PP, here's a direct quote. PP is the practice of encoding visual clues and symbols into works of popular culture aimed at large audiences, which depict a real-world event yet to happen or currently happening. Page 241. Um, chapter 12 reminds us of the trauma of 9-11. It also lists times in popular culture where the number has popped up. Terminator 2, The Matrix, Simpsons, Independence Day, and a bunch of examples in music from Jay-Z, Super Tramp, and, Michael Jackson album, and, a, and a Michael Jackson album sleeve. Um, another incident describes a Lil Wayne music video where the performer is in a theater with 12 skeletons. Uh, in the film Dark Knight Rises, a map is shown, uh, and on this map, the words Sandy Hook is circled. Five months after the film was released, the Sandy Hook, the infamous Sandy Hook shooting, occurred. Um, oh gosh, it's just I, my heart goes out to all those families. By the way, of the Sandy Hook shootings and all these shoot, all these shootings. Um, another infamous shooting in Colorado happened the same year, where twelve people died and seventy injured. But I'm sure the Lil Wayne video was just a coincidence, right? Because he had twelve skeletons in the theater. But it's probably just a coincidence. Uh, chapter 13 dives into transhumanism. Synchronistically, before I started this chapter, Jay Dyer... Oh, yeah, this video is awesome. Jay Dyer uploaded a video titled uh, AI Girlfriends. And uh, uh, there's a keyword that's... Uh, YouTube doesn't like this keyword. Um, AI Girlfriends and SEX Bots. Uh, Ex Machina predition, Predictions. I'll put that link in the description of this video. Um, transhumanism is the merging of humanity with technology for... For decades, there has been a fascination with the elite class of tinkering with the natural state of what it is to be human, their way of associating what they psychopathically consider to be their god, their godlike status, and this goes, this goes some way to explaining their, rever their reverence towards and fascination for technology. The Dark Priest class had have revealed in their own writings how they fantasize about society merging its innate human qualities with technological improvements. This is one of those central tenets of the New World Order. It sounds like the stuff of science fiction films for sure, but hopefully the previous chapter on the workings of predictive programming will, will, will have gone some way towards explaining why that would be, and that's a direct quote from page 262. Um, all of these chapters are so so important this book is 10 out of 10 10 out of 10 go buy this book go buy this book <laughs> um, Devlin then points out how in the new age everything with the word smart in front of it is usually highly questionable our smartphones that keep people docile staring at a black mirror for hours on end with zero goals or thoughts in mind except hedonism um, the author then goes on to quote David Icke's early works and show us even more symbolism. Uh, Beyonce's single ladies video is lit littered with the transhumanist agenda and it was an extremely popular song. Oh, and that's the end of my notes. So, um, the last couple chapters gets into Satanism and what Satanism really means because I talk about Satanism all the time and people just literally like... I wish I had a dollar for every time I brought up the subject of Satanism. People just roll their eyes because I say, I tell them, Satanism is all about selfishness. It's all about mini me, like me, me, like Mark Passio says, mini me, Satanism. Satanism is all about me, me, me. Somebody who is a Satanist wakes up and says, what can I do today for me and my family? And he, like, in this person's mindset, the, the rest of the world never comes into consideration, right? The rest of the world, like, because there's so much suffering in the world, and these, sat these satanic people with this satanic ideologies, they don't understand. Like, they don't, they don't think about, you know, what their actions are doing and what their actions are contributing to. Like, you know, the idea of paying taxes, you're, you're contributing to war. I mean, you're... you're, you're 
you're participating in it. You're giving, you're signing your life over. Like when you go and when you go and get a license, you're participating in it. You're giving this slavery like a reason to exist. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean, man? So, uh, yeah. So I know I blew through a lot of information, but that's that's how this book is. That's the nature of this book. This book is 500 pages. It goes through so much information. I like I didn't even know where to begin. I was kind of like for the chapters of 10, 13, and 14, I was kind of scratching my head and getting overwhelmed with information because there's so many different things I want to talk about. And uh, yeah, it's like so much good stuff. But I'll close out. Well, actually, before I close out. Um, this was a very serious book review. The next book review is probably going to be the Chelsea Ho the Chelsea Hotel written by Didi Ramon, since it goes in line with all this music, and I love the Ramones. Shout out to the Ramones. The Ramones are epic. And also, we have a um, we have a punk rock show coming up that I'm actually opening up the show. The Foley's are headlining. Does that look good on the camera? Yeah. Okay. The Foley's are headlining. So January 5th, if you're in the northern Indiana area, come on out. Or if you're, if you're not in the northern Indiana area, you can go to twitch.com slash MEAC574. I will be opening up the show. The show will probably start at about 7 p.m. Uh, probably, you know, punk rock time. You know how it goes. We always wait for bands to show up and get their equipment set up. So we got January 5th, Dead on Sarah, which is myself. Uh, Steve's in the band, the Foley's, the Distractions, Absentees. Um, it's going to be a great show. Michiana Education and Arts Club. To preserve, promote, uh, to preserve literacy. I always forget the credo. I need to memorize that stuff. So, to close out this book review, I hope you guys made it this far. Thank you if you did. Thank you to Mark Devlin. You're an absolute mother effing legend. I'm trying not to cuss because of the platform I'm going to post this on to, but you are an absolute legend. Thank you for all the work that you've put into this book. And, um... For Musical Truth, I plan on going directly to your website. I want a signed copy of the Musical Truth, too. So hopefully we can get some funding over in your area. Cause, and guys, support this man's dream. I mean, give give some money directly to him. Support. We all need money. You know how it is. Um, so to close out, I'm going to do a uh, direct quote from the book. The fork in the road has never been more blatant. In one direction lies a nightmare society ruled by tyranny, oppression, and perpetual slavery. In the other lies a future where humanity finally takes back the reins with the f from the force of evil that's been controlling it for thousands of years. We're, we're hurtling ever closer to the final choice by the day. And at a glance at any mainstream news bulletin reminds us, and if the former is allowed to become a reality, the future it will bring can barely be contemplated. How would we explain to our children and grandchildren that we did nothing to prevent it? We still have the opportunity to, to achieve the latter. However, it's those of us here today that will decide. No one else. Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven puts it. Uh, there's still time to change the road that you are on. The only question remains, therefore, how much do we want it? Like I said, hope you made it this far. Buy the book. Support freedom. Uh, we're tired of this tyranny. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this S word anymore. Um, keep talking about natural law. Talk natural law. Talk natural law. Peace out, Internet.